I welcome you all to uh, our town hall meeting today. Uh, I want to introduce our member of parliament, Patty Sadu. He's traveled all the way up from, uh, along with his assistant, Seamus Heffernan. I've traveled all the way up from, uh, from Mission, via Lillouette, Lytton, Spencer's Bridge, Yale. So they're on a road trip today, and they've got about a little over an hour to uh, hear the concerns and questions of our community. So, um, the, the issues, I went and met Eric Perry, or uh, Johnny in the spring this year, trying to bring his attention to the plight of our water system with our debt, given the fact that other communities have received much greater funding for similar water systems, and they have a huge tax base to fund it. And uh, compare that to Spencer Bridge, where we have a $1.2 million debt for this water system that doesn't work, doesn't serve the community very well and uh, we have 114 people to pay for. There was an article in the paper uh, earlier this year that outlined, uh, I have some copies on the sideboard if you want to have a look at them. It was an article where uh, F.P. Sadu, along with the mayors of Mission and Abbotsford and the MLAs and from the Abbotsford Mission, uh, made an announcement of a 4.2, for $4.203 million, $4.281 million water treatment facility for a mission that deserves mission in Abbotsford, and the federal government's portion of that was $3,078,000. That left Abbotsford admission to fund $1.203 million. There's 150,000 people that be mission in Abbotsford. They have thousands of businesses, industries, agricultural, industrial, commercial, institutional, and have a huge tax base to pay for that. And you compare that to our little community of Spencer's Creek, we have a similar $1.2 million debt, and we have 114 taxpayers to pay for it. So, I mean, it's completely unfair. So, I hope to see MP Sadu to bring this uh, to his attention, with the hope that he can pull a rabbit out of the hat and find a million, whatever it is, zero on this debt. So this is why it's here. And the other issues are, of course, our Thompson Steelhead fishery, the, the demise of it. If we don't do anything uh, right away to stop the destruction of this fishery, and also the stockpiling of the railway ties by the CPR of the town. So these are three federal issues. There's nothing here to do with John Horgan and the Liberals and the provincial government at all. This is all federal. So, with that, I'd like to introduce Johnny Sadu and give him the microphone. Well, let me thank you uh, for coming out in this big number here today uh, to discuss issues of the area. I'd like to thank Mike and uh, Mr. Rice, actually, uh, wrote a couple pages on the issues. Uh, I did try coming uh, a few times, unsuccessfully. A couple of months ago, we had a festival here. Uh, we were coming back from Hamlet, and we wanted to say hello. But finally, I'm, I'm glad uh, that I'm able to shake uh, your hand and discuss some issues. I'm glad to see Harry Raleigh uh, here, representing the area. I've known Harry from a long time as well. Uh, Ken Peterson, that's another colleague of mine, traveling with us, uh, he's the media president. Uh, I believe in two years and one month, uh, this is our first meeting at Spencer's Ridge. Uh, uh, I'd like to listen more uh, than to say this stuff. I was very fortunate to, to work with the government uh, who understand the issue of uh, Revenue maybe, uh, not to be uh, I think, in, uh, being a rookie and the last couple of years, I was able to uh, bring in under, almost under $50 million into the area. Uh, I'm sorry to say that this is the only area I haven't uh, made any announcement yet, but I'm very hopeful. Uh, we have about eight municipalities in our writing. It's a large writing. 22,000 square kilometers. Uh, almost every municipality has some sort of funding uh, when it comes to wastewater uh, or running water. Uh, just to those very keen uh, uh, that 
by the end of this term, if not by the end of this term, uh, if you guys do decide to let them uh, look one more term of liberal government, there should be no reason that this country uh, won't have a running uh, water. Uh, we're one of the G7 countries we brag about. Uh, the fully developed country in the middle country, we still have uh, a lot of problems uh, at, the, uh, at the reserves uh, in towns like this. So we are working very hard uh, to address those issues. Uh, First Nation, uh, uh, we like to address those issues uh, uh, they've been ignored from years and years and years. Uh, so those are the few issues uh, actually I'm, uh, I'm here to listen to what the problem is. I'm lucky to work with you. Uh, I have a wonderful staff uh, and mission office and Ottawa office. Uh, I've been in business, I should tell, uh, say, a political business for the last 20 years. That's nothing new to me. Uh, Ottawa is not new to me. I've been going to Ottawa, Montreal, uh, grooming new leaders of my party uh, for the last 20 years. So it, it's uh, the, the, uh, the climate for me in Ottawa is pretty friendly. Uh, I can talk to any minister. It's very accessible. So far in two years, uh, I've been successful in any issue I have. And my approach is uh, to take these concerns from the bottom up. Uh, I'm not one of those guys that I uh, bring in uh, command from God down here. So this is my approach. Uh, I've been involved in every uh, board uh, society for the last 25, 30 years in my uh, in my area, uh, maybe a few of the police board and board of governors of the University of Fraser Valley. Uh, pretty good service is my middle name, so um, I'm here to serve. Yeah. I'll open the floor for question and answers. Mike, if you want to share more with it. Thank you, Johnny. So um, here we are. We have a, a short uh, period of time to ask some questions and get, hopefully get some answers. Uh, the three areas that we can relative to federal jurisdiction are the flight of our, our water system and debt relief through the gas tax fund, hopefully, the top fisheries of the Thompson River, the steelhead fishery, and the stockpiling of the railway ties by the CPR. So those are the three main issues that I feel that are uh, critical to Spencer's prison. Of course, you may not be wrong, but uh, those are the three that I think are, given the time frame, those are the ones that we should deal with. So, Anybody want to step up and ask a question? Laurie Kingston. Come on now. Come on up. I actually, I actually originally was wanting to speak to the... I originally wanted to speak to the water situation, but from hearing that you were coming, we've had an incredible reaction from our fishing community because of a very, very dire situation, which... Um, the water situation isn't going to, you know, isn't going to affect us at such a dire short notice as these fish are. So I'm wondering if I could just read a small thing here regarding our fishery. My husband and I bought a log cabin pub in the spring of 1996. The days of 135, a lot of people remember this, 135 man CP steel game for three months in the spring and four months of the steelhead anglers in the fall and the winter. This did not last very long, however. In 1998, I became involved in a number of conference calls with various biologists and other government fisheries personnel regarding the alarming decline of steelhead stocks and the possibility of closing the Thompson River just two weeks into the opening of the fishery. This is when we realized that a fragile resource, we what a fragile resource we were depending on to make a living and began to diversify our business. After all, the loss of this high season only just made us the same as all other tiny BC communities, Savannah, West Wall, 70 Mile, to mention only a few, when the summer business ends around September. We now have to draw people into our doors as opposed to them pouring in off the rivers and the railways with very little effort on our part. We also have to manage our businesses differently, stockpiling while the income is high to make it through a much longer period. Um, 
Although the socioeconomic aspect of the loss of these majestic Thompson River steelhead is a huge concern in Spencer's Bridge, I would like to bring a more passionate view of what these internationally renowned superstars of the angling world mean to the fishermen themselves by reading a very short commentary by an old friend, Dana Stern, and Scott Simpson, who wrote a little, a little article in the Wallachian Press. Now, I originally could not read this without breaking into tears. So this is a very, very important uh, aspect of our steelhead fishery. Um, on an early August afternoon in 1905, Earth clinging to the stone tower just south of Spencer's Bridge lost its grip and collapsed into the valley below. Tons of rock fell into the Thompson River, downing it for several hours. Eighteen people died in that landslide. The indigenous people who made this valley their home believed that the dead would sometimes stay in the place of their passing. James Tate, the 19th century ethnographer who studied these people, wrote that these shades were light gray in color with mouths and eyes that appeared like blue fire. Sometimes, waiting in the dark for first light, you can see them. When mists are on the river on the outskirts of British, uh, Spence's Bridge, apparitions appear on this pool that Thompson Angus called the graveyard. For over two decades, I've been part, this is James Stern, I've been part of the skeleton crew that fishes this pool in sync with the arrival of the Thompson's remarkable auto run of steelhead. While Thompson steelhead are powerful, aggressive, aggressive sound mitts that are entirely in character with their natal waters. And Thompson is not a river that welcomes you. It confronts you. It is broad, strong, and unforgiving. To win a chance to present your fly, you wait waist deep in heavy, in heavy current, anchoring your feet on the riverbed's greasy bottles, passing only when you are certain of your balance. Often, it's so cold at first light, you must break ice off the rod guides so your fly line does not jam when you cast. Suffer a bad slip or lose your composure when a fish attacks your fly, and you might find yourself among the shades. For decades, anglers have come to Britain's Spencer's Bridge from all over the world, seeking the challenge of the graveyard, hoping to hook a wild Thompson steelhead. Each one brought to hand and reverently released in his memory for life. But this year, Thompson is really the weakest steelhead return on record. Biologists estimate that fewer than 200 fish will survive the spawn compared to thousands in their past. Everyone has an opinion about how to protect future generations of these fish. Some want the Thompson closed to preserve the vestiges of 2017's year class. Others oppose this, believing that a river empty of anglers encourages poachers to kill steelhead. These opposing views within the angling community are symptomatic of a significant problem facing Thompson Steelhead, an angling community divided and focused on the wrong things. For many years, anglers fought amongst themselves about the use of bait on the river, some wanting to continue to use it, others saying it contributed to steelhead mortality. A few years ago, when bait was finally banned, the anti-bait brigade claimed victory, both for itself and the river. But the bait battle was our ultimate undoing. It created a toxic environment within the Thompson Angle community. We fought amongst ourselves so loudly and for so long, shooting at each other while the enemy rolled its tanks, ripped down our streets. The enemy? Interception of Thompson steelhead in commercial and indigenous net fisheries in the Fraser River and Fraser Approach areas, a couple of hundred kilometers downstream from Spencer's Bridge. As much as 25% of migrating Thompson steel that are lost to these nets each year. Unlike the complex puzzle of climate change, working together to ban these net fisheries during steelhead migration periods was a straightforward opportunity to support steelhead survival, but we didn't do it. So now we can't fish with bait, but there aren't any steelhead left to fish for. Once considered the greatest of all steelhead rivers, Today, the Thompson warns of what we accomplished by picking the wrong battles. The Thompson Steelhead Run has been in decline for years. As the run diminished, so did the opportunity. The Thompson was always a tough river to fish, the toughest. But a decade of smaller and smaller runs and the threat of emergency river closures gradually eliminated a whole group of traveling anglers. They moved on to lesser but more reliable waters, leaving the Thompson and a small group of diehards on their own. 
a mighty voice, the voice of the international angling community and the tourism dollars it brought to a less traveled part of British Columbia was lost. Lost, like the run of great fish, like the angling culture it nurtured, like a history we forgot or never knew, where men with blackened faces ignored the night cold and speared the great fish in waters illuminated by a torch in their canoe. Ghosts of the Thompson? They're real. They emanate blue fire in the colors of torchlight. But there are so few left, and we've waited too long. Is it pointless to continue? Not yet. Not while the final few wander the waters between Lytton and Savannah. We must finally do what we should have done long ago. There's much at stake, perhaps the very soul of our sport, perhaps even our own. We dishonor ourselves by abandoning them. Sure. Thank you, Lori. Steve Rice, come on down. Thank you, Michael. I'm just going to expand on what Lori said because we're addressing the federal issue here, and this is uh, why it's just important that we do this. And, and you know, the collateral damage, of course, is our community expenses, Rich, if we lose this field at Fisher. That's the collateral damage. The big thing is for our children and grandchildren to have to experience the Thompson River Steelhead, which is considered, by the way, in its day, best of class in the world. I'm convinced if this fishery was in Vancouver or Victoria, we wouldn't be here right now today. Because it's best in class in the world of people that don't have a lot of votes, we don't have a lobby group, we don't have a, lot, a, a, a loud voice. We need to raise our voices today, folks, and we're doing it. We put a petition out starting on online, thanks to Jim Ryan, after a little powwow, over 400 signatures when I last checked. That just went online on Monday. So that's pretty significant already. We're getting our voices. They're getting loud and they're getting out of there. So I sent this into Yaki last week into his office. And, I, and so I'm just going to read it because uh, I don't remember what I said. I'm, I'm so upset about what's happened to our steelhead. I've been entrenched in the steelhead issue for over 25 years, long before being elected. It is the foundation of any economic vibrancy remaining within Spence's Bridge. The few amenities left in the town are at the edge of collapse. The Steel Lake Fishery, fishery yeah, which is a huge economic shot in the arm, during the shoulder months of October, November, December, has been the lifeblood of our community. It has kept businesses alive. We now have only October. Two-thirds of the lifeblood is gone, and that third is in danger. Our community is on life support. I fear the loss of our beloved steelhead would be tantamount to pulling the plug. That said, in all our heart of hearts, we would just like this magnificent fish to be a part of our children and grandchildren's lives. Not telling them stories about how back in the days when the greatest steelhead on earth passed by our back doors every winter, but about just showing them pictures. We want them to know the thrill, the passion, the love that so many for this spectacular fish share. There are many pieces to this puzzle if we wish to get this flood, this food and ceremonial fishery back for our indigenous people while also opening the door for a robust recreational fishery. The commercial chunk fishery is a big piece of that puzzle. Contrary to the DFO claim that the chunk fishery has been moved to, uh, has been moved to less impacting interception, the exact opposite is true possibly through no fault of their own, because the province has suggested that October 10th is the sneak peek of the steelhead run. A simple check of the Albion test fishery will say October 20th to 24th is probably more close to the truth. A serious look at moving the chum opening into November, or as suggested by a few commercial chum fishermen to myself, uh, um, would, would be helpful outside of the peak of the uh, steelhead run. Possibly even more helpful would be moving the zone to where they drop their nets, to an area outside the paths of the steelhead. They have said this is completely doable because they can still get their chum and the steelhead will not be caught in the bycatch, so the mortality rate would uh, be decreased. And by the way, the mortality rate of this interception of the chum fishery has been uh, targeted at about 40%. That's pretty damn high, and that that's, was said to me by DFO themselves at, uh, at many of our meetings that I've been to. So 40% mortality on an interception that uh, arguably, ha when you're down to 180 or wherever we're at right now, 190 as a return, when you lose one fish, it's a disaster. When you're losing 30 or 40 fish, it's, it's almost towards the end. So we need to really 
uh, uh, rise up and deal with this now. But uh, uh, anyways, uh, I, I, divert, I divert and I'm trying to get back. The com commercial fishery family I spoke to claimed that moving to a different area would be a, but they did say, that's what I was trying to get to, but they did say the change that they did not feel would be embraced by DFO because it's, it involves a regulation change and it would be a lot of hard work. They weren't ready to roll up their sleeves and actually make that change to a different zone because it's pretty much, it's easy to stay the status quo, folks. We all know that at all levels of government, but it's hard to do the hard work, roll up the sleeves and get things done. So that's something maybe we can lose with. I would suggest if there was every time you pull up the collective sleeves and get to work on saving the world famous wild Thompson River steelhead, best of class, not in our province, not in our country, but in the world, now would be the time. Oh, hi, Tracy. Come on down. I'm sorry, this is sound. Do you want a microphone, Skippy? No, it comes in. I'll try. If you can't hear me, stick your hand up. Uh, my name is Tracy Murdoch. I'm here representing the Camelot Fly Fishers, the Steelhead Committee, for which Len Piggin is the president, who could not be here today. And hopefully, you don't find it here. Thompson River Sailhead is an iconic fish that belongs in this river naturally and is in extreme conservation level for the second year in a row with only 130 fish returning to spawn this year for the lowest from record. Dr. Gordon Bacon's graph on returning steelhead shows such a steep decline. Even by next year, we could have no returning steelhead. This fish is a fantastic fish for fish for. This fish is a fabulous tasting fish. It is probably why natives use it as a surname. There are good economic returns for the people that come from all over the world to fish this fish. But the most important thing at this point is that the Thompson River steelhead is near extirpation from this river. This is why we must go to extreme measures to protect this fish. I believe that nobody has the right to participate in actions or inactions that contributes to the demise of this Thompson River seal head or any species. The biggest problem with the low numbers of the Thompson River seal head is that the government has not done anything about it. There is no argument, there is no excuses for the government's inaction. Quit passing, pacifying these with endless studies. There have been a lot of people over 30 years giving volunteer time to improve the return of the Thompson River seal head. <clears throat> and nothing has been done. Such a waste. The recommendations are at hand from the Thompson River seal head assembly last December that was attended by interest groups from all areas by invitation, and the results are at hand, right here, and can be provided for you. It is a well known that the chum fishery is a significant factor in the low returns of the Thompson River steelhead in the way of bycatch. This must be stopped. LeBlanc said, at this time DFO is working to develop a mock model of, of assessment to measure the exposure of the interior Fraser River steelhead during the commercial chunk fisheries. To me, in government thought, that sounds like a couple of years down the road. <laughs> Observing the graph means in a couple of years there are no fish. Does that make the interior natives happy? I doubt it. Sports fishers happy? Of course not. Tourism happy? No, it does not. It doesn't make does it make any sense to the government? Does it make them happy? Or maybe it does. Is the steelhead gone? Probably gone. Why does it make sense to destroy the capability of many to catch food? That is fun only so money can go into the pockets of a few. 
I also have the Canada Fly Fishers Initiatives for the recovery of the Thompson River steelhead in this packet. And in this, we say that amongst other things, the river needs guardians, and the river needs to be shut down from October 1 to June 1, which is painful for me to say this because I love the fishing. And during that time, catch and release only. And the KFF is also in here. Uh, their press release on October 26 this year asking for an audit on the Thompson River steelhead, which is needed more than an audit on grizzly bears and also a news article on the sentencing of a man this September who had in his possession 26 rainbow trout that he had poached from the river in one day. Poaching is a huge problem in the Thompson River, not just for trout, which are an important fish for the Thompson River steelhead, but also poaching for the Thompson River steelhead. It is a management problem the government is responsible for, and I believe that with proper coal management, that with the government, with the government, with all governments, that there can be fish for food, fun for everyone, forever. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak on this deal? Or Jacques, come on down. Uh, just a minute, I'd like to uh, uh, maybe ask uh, what the agreement between the United States and the Canadian government on the fishing of the west coast of Canada. Um, I just had a quick look on the internet today. The Alaskan fish fisheries put two billion pounds of fish off Alaska last year. Now everybody knows the supply goes up to Alaska and still it goes up to Alaska. So I'd like the minister maybe to respond to that, to what's happening with NAFTA, maybe we can uh, hit them with that a bit, because they are making the fish off Alaska, and they even fish in the Wanapuka, and they sell 150 to 150 countries of fish. Uh, my second uh, question is, Hopefully, the federal government could help us with the cost of the water. It's astronomical. I have a business and I pay thousands of dollars, and then we've got another thousand dollars a year for 20 years, which may not seem a lot, but it is a lot when you're running on a short profit, especially when our river doesn't open until June. Could be shut down at the end of September. Every year, the province in the EFO collect 50 to 60 fish opposite my house. I've got radio attacks in them. They've been doing this for probably 20 years. And how they are killed just for that last. Right. So, those are just questions that I think need answering. Because I know that there's a few businesses in the town. And we're not doing work. We need that. And I used to get people from Japan to fish here every year. They come here for three, four, five weeks. They go to Cameron's, they go into the valley. I had six people wanting to fly in from New York. But they couldn't, I couldn't tell them when the river was open or shut. They would fly into Vancouver. Or a car, staying a week, in Vancouver, come up here for a week, do shopping in the area, leave money in the town. But money. So maybe those two questions could be addressed. Thanks. Thanks, Roy. Anybody else? I was talking about the Wisconsin Tila. Tim, right? Come on down. Thank you very much. Um, this is a copy of the petition that we put on on Monday. Okay. Um, you mentioned that you are you have access to all the ministers, so maybe you can take this to Mr. Blanc. Tell him what you heard. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you.
I'm not going to get out, Michael, but can I just make a quick comment from here? Okay. Um, and just so you know, there's a couple of places we can target to have the federal government help us. Of course, the intersection is one with the chunk fishery. The other one is habitat, because the salmon and the steelhead enjoy the same habitat. Our river temperatures for the Nicola, the dead men, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the tributaries are in dire straits of habitat restoration. We, I sit on Fraser Basin, we did have a meeting this week, and we have got an application in for some funding for habitat uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the Nicola and, uh, and the Bonaparte Park and the Dead Man. And so, look at that funding applica application friendly because uh, it'll help the salmon, but it'll also help the steelhead. So that's another place where the federal government could come into play. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shall we uh, move on to our water? Questions? Yeah. Please. Uh, jump in real quick. Right. Right. So, uh, if, uh, if we get questions like right there, we're going to answer those uh, at the end. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, we were going to jump in there, but we're gonna, if we have more questions, we'll try to stagger along to what you think that you weren't going to get at least an attempt to an answer. And we have, uh, like we like I said, we're on the road today. We're here for just over about 45, 50 minutes. Please tell us what your concerns are at the federal level as briefly and concisely as possible. I'm going to leave a pile of business cards here as well. This is not the end of our discussion, but we wanted to come here and meet you and hear from you face to face first. So from there, please continue. Thank you, Seamus. Um, so the bottom line in the fish that stops the steelhead fishery is that we need federal uh, government to uh, adopt policies and practices to, to, to uh, cooperate with the stakeholders and restore this fishery. The other issue that uh, I think is near and dear to everybody's heart is the one of our our uh, new water system that's putting a huge financial burden on most everybody here, and it's proven to be inadequate, unreliable, and only just prohibitively expensive. Does anybody want to speak on the water issue? Dorothy? Come on now. <laughs> Did you need this? I thought Lori was going to talk about the water, so I didn't make a speech, but um, we have the inexpensive bridge. We have 13 rooms, six with no water. We pay $4,000 a year. We're closed for six months, basically. We have 10 people for six months. I went to the water property. <coughs> they took my piece of paper and they went like that across the table. Didn't even introduce themselves. Absolutely no help at all. It's ridiculous. <laughs> And the fisheries, I just want to say that um, Lori's bumper sticker says it best. Um, if it ain't Steelhead Thompson, it's just there it is. a Steelhead. Yeah. <laughs> and they talk about stories. Put that on the SUV right now. It's just a Steelhead. <laughs> Apparently, Jack Kierwex's son and Ernest Hemingway's son, and all these guys just come to our inn and drink Remy Martin and steaks and. Um, we get like three fishermen, and um, the railroad ties, of course, is very near and dear to my heart because it leaked all summer. If those were to catch fire, I don't know if you got my email. I've been um, phoning them regularly. One time after I phoned them, they dropped about a thousand more. They won't return my calls and tell me, you know, roughly if or when they're going to get rid of them, but. We and all our guests would be dead from the fumes. And it's just tons of places with no people where they could store them, I'm sure. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so the railway tie issue is that they're stockpiling these toxic and flammable railway ties that compromises this whole community. We went through a state of emergency all summer with forest fires and Spencer's Bridge dodged the bullet. We didn't, we almost got caught fire down the road, but it didn't come into town. And we don't have the capacity to do anything to put out a tie fire like that. Neither does the CPI. So, I don't want to presuppose what your concern is, but I was, uh, my concern is that I would ask Yanni to contact the Minister of Transport, Honorable Mark Garneau, and get him to direct the CPR to remove these railway ties from not just our community, but any other community. It, in my view, it's a lot of ante ready to happen. If that catches fire, it's going to destroy this community and set the forest on fire and have no capacity to put it on. So, does that 
sort of some summarize your concern? Okay. I just wanted to say about what Dorothy said. One of the reasons we went to the GRD to speak to the reason or try to speak to the reason from last year to this year, we had a 53% increase in our user trees of water. 53% from last year. And that's over and above the $60,000 That's, over, 60, that's, that's just year. what our user fee is for our quarterly bill. Um, and how much do you I pay $800, uh, $800 a quarter for 12 rooms in a motel that are empty for three months, for at least three, maybe now five months. We're, close, we're empty. We have 10 people in six months, and we pay 1000 bucks every three months. And how much was your assessment at the beginning of your six lots? Um, $60,000 or something? Oh, to, to yeah, eight. Oh, yeah, I was going to have to pay $60,000 if I wanted to pay off my portion of debt. So, yeah. plus, plus your quarterly fees. Oh, I pay $8,800 a year for water in British Columbia, Canada. And I'll get in touch with World Vision. Yeah, that's ridiculous. And we got a problem with paying the water here. That's okay, excuse me, money. Chief. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Excuse me, Chief Arm, you have, you have your hand up? Chief Arnie Arm, our fire chief? Uh, Come on down, Arnie. With our fire season, it was a major, major concern. Um, and with the ties, I've been in touch with Calgary, I've been in touch with Kamloops, and this was. Uh, probably two months ago, they said that these ties would be out of here in two weeks. Since then, I've been in touch with them again, and uh, the new roadmaster in Kamloops was supposed to come down here and meet with me and deal with this issue. And so far, he hasn't shown up. So it is a major problem. It's a major concern. It's an eyesore. It's a pollution problem. And if we have another bad fire season next year, like they've already predicted, uh, we could be in serious This is CB Rail. CB Rail. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, one other thing. Uh, uh, is it a big, is a big government going to help the uh, British Columbia with the forestry rehabilitation? I.e., giving them funds for the province to help replant trees. Which many years ago, back in the 80s, they did do a funding for the But I think that would help as well. Come on now. I don't want to show you a picture. I live on IR1. Can you refer to one? This is what comes with our hat. That's it. Water. This, after draining the tub, that's the sediment. Okay. They finally called in. For four years I've been complaining to the chief down here. They finally called in the health people. What do you call them? I, I interior health. I'm, an, I'm American, so I'm learning this. But anyway, the interior health people came in. Oh, the water safe to drink. Until last week, we had a boil notice on for the first time in about three years. But the amount of sediments, we had had a new water heater, and it was there for 14 months. We made them drink. And they, they put it in a big tub. It was over an inch and a half in this big tub that they drained the water tank into of sediment. As a healthcare professional, I know that filtering this through your body, the sediment of magnesium and calcium and stuff, it's not good on your golf, bladder, liver, kidneys. You know, it creates kidney stones, uh, things like that. We have a guy here in town that's on dialysis. He doesn't need that in his body. They need a, a system to filtrate that stuff out of this water before it even comes to the homes. Their recommendation was to put an individual filter in our home only because we're the ones complaining. That's not the solution. I want everybody here to know that's not the solution to put an individual filter in one home. It needs to be a mass filter on the whole system up there. And it's sad that they spent all of this money and we still have this huge problem. A huge problem with the water. And it is going to affect your health. 
Thank you. Is this common for many of you the water that you're seeing in your homes right now with the sediment? Do we have the same water? water? No. Yeah. Yes. 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 Uh, it splits up there somewhere. Yeah, we don't have that. But it comes out of the same reserve. We told them to go to testing to find somebody in town that had a recent uh, water heater installed. I don't know if they contacted anybody. I said drain somebody else's water heater and see what's going on across the river. I don't know how far it went because we are dealing with the band. And you guys all know who the control is of the band. And we won't get into that, but uh, I'm here for people's health. I'm here for, as the representative from the community. And I want you to know what's going on over on our reserve is happening to the rest of you. And I'm sure that your waters are affect the same as ours. Um, well, we don't have a boil well, water. And, and I'm going to give you a clean version, and that is dirty dirty. My tub is clean. I like to do that. And I don't want to be in this. And I'm sure we'll create it. And since we've been here for four years, we had to buy water. One of the time, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Which we can't afford. That's why I retired here. Because of the taxes and that. Then we could, and yeah, I can't afford to pay it because one of the TNRD, not cheap, but one of the TNRD turned around to me, I'll go borrow the money out of the bank to pay for it. Which I come from a very group. There's no need for it. Why do we have to pay? The got paid for because they're operating, we're not. We're a small community here. Can you take where the uh, where we're all back here that we can pitch out the cut out of the pocket and just give it away? Why should we? And you know, I'm 67, going up 68. And I'm not doing the one that's trying to enjoy life here. It's the same as Sheila, that's the same as Sheila. You know, I, I have to agree with you that. Sure. I've been here and I've seen this fishing was really good, where they used to have a pitch after they used to keep up to make sure everything's all right. Then the federal says, oh, we can't afford it, but yet they can afford to come to charge me $10,000 for a property that I already paid for, that I own, now I might as well say I don't. You know, my wife, you know, it's, it's sad. Why is a little community like this getting hit for you? Their mistakes. Not our mistakes. You know, you gotta think of that. You know, it is not that. But why do we get hit? When the big city, and that part of one time, they were paying three hundred twenty dollars water, sewage, garbage, the whole works, and we're paying eight hundred fifty dollars a year for less. Plus ten grand. Yeah, and it's supposed to be. You know, the water is unbelievable. What we have to used to pay seventy six dollars a year, now it's gone to three hundred something or whatever it is may be. I don't think that's fair. We're going to hit forty dollars a city. Well, I went from here to pay my water, the woman could not believe what we would pay. So what's the $10,000 for? No, I'm sorry. Okay, you will to answer you now. Okay. You know, when the TNRD took over our water system from the Spencer's Bridge Water Works in yeah. 2008. No, the, earlier than that. Yeah. Earlier. 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 Anyway, the new when system was developed over the country reserve. They upgraded the, the well system for the next well, and they put a piping. Constructed the pipeline all the way up, built the reservoir up on the hill across from us here, and then it tied in with the distribution system. There was a five point something million dollar bill for the whole system. INAC paid a portion, the province paid a portion, and the ratepayers in Spencer's Bridge got salvaged with a $1.2 million bill. 
and there's 114 retailers in Spencer's Bridge and five businesses. So that equates to a $10,000 bill on your parcel tax on your properties. And there was the option was you could do a one-time payment of $10,000, or if you couldn't do that, they'll stretch it out for 20 years and you pay $20,000. So we have a twenty thousand. I stretch mine over twenty years. So I'm paying twenty thousand dollars for a water bill. And I, like I said, the reason I came to see you in the spring was regarding your announcement of the joint uh, canal lake water treatment facility with Mission and Abbotsford, whereby the feds, the federal government, kicked in three million seventy eight thousand, and the portion that was split between Mission and Abbotsford was one million two hundred three thousand. So, like I said, there's 150,000 people that have been spent in the mission in Abbotsford. They have zillions of businesses and industries and agriculture and a huge tax base. And we're getting hit with this, and that's split with two communities, so 600 grand each. And we're getting hit with a $1.2 million bill with a similar system, and there's 114 people paying the bill. So, I came to you asking for some debt relief. Somehow, somewhere, People in this community are looking toward you as our federal government representative to pull a political rabbit out of the hat and find some money somewhere and zero out this debt. Is that correct, Mr. General? So, brother, and, and the, on top of that, you know, on top of that, we're on a water restriction. When we have the free system over across the way for over 100 years. We had unlimited irrigation, unlimited water for, for, for use, and it was we paid a nominal fee for it. And that all changed when it was turned over to the TNRD and the federal government got involved. And uh, so it was grossly unfair and it's unacceptable. So we're being discriminated against because we're in a small community. So the proportion of, of the debt financing is just completely off key. So I think that's what Dr. Paul is referring to. That's right. And what Lori was saying. Lori has six, and her husband has six but properties. Has track, excuse me, Paul. Excuse me. Paying the bill. Lori, for example, has six properties, and she's got to get $60,000. Oh, my God. Six times 800 a year. Plus the No. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But well, anyway, too much. So, Tracy, come on. Lori. I just like to add that of that 114 people that pay taxes, Town, the majority of them are retired and many of them are disabled. Uh, we have very few wage earners in this town and people don't want to move to this town to help build the town back up because of, they don't want to pay those water bills. They take a look at what they have to offer in this community and what they're going to have to pay. They don't want to buy property. We can't expand because of these problems. We can't grow. Come on down, Daryl.
and there doesn't seem to be any way that we can go <coughs> both. And that's what we would like. We'd like to be able to use enough for our little gardens, for our orchards, because we, you know, we are a very low income area, and that's all just been scrap. Come on up, what's your name? I forgot. Tommy, that Tommy, glass of water cost me two dollars. <laughs> 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 if you allow me, I'll, I'll make a comment about, about one very Creek that's near and dear to my heart. I don't know if you noticed, Jaddy and Seamus, but when you came into town, you saw the waterfall over there. Okay, well, up above there's a dam. It was built in 1913 by the same man that built this hall, uh, Archie Glenn's. And he installed the first hydroelectric power in, that, in the area in 1913 to provide electricity for the community and the railways. In 1961, BC Hydro was created and it took over all of these little operations and shut them all down and put everybody on their BC Hydro grid and gave everybody a bill. And that was in the, in the, 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 the way it was for 40 years until the, uh, the policy was changed by the provincial government of BC Hydro to have a uh, standing offer program where they encourage small communities like Spencer's Bridge and the First Nations communities like Cook's Ferry to develop their micro hydro and contribute to clean energy, clean green energy. Murray Creek was also, when, we, when the hydro was taken out in 1961, that left the uh, potable water, the domestic water service, and the irrigation, and we have Spencer's Bridge had ample water. That all changed again in 2000. When was it? Five. 2005. And here we are today where you have a, a desert community that's less than 10 inches of precipitation a year. And like Lori says, we're restricted to water in two days, two hours every time of day. So the this whole water system that we're on now is served this side of the river, in the country reserve. But the other side of the main community is over there. And Murray Creek will serve our community much better. We want to attract uh, uh, agribusiness in this community. We need irrigation. Our fire department, of which a lot of us here are members, we don't have uh, enough uh, fire protection because this well system is not adequate. It's good good for two hours of fighting a house fire, but uh, that's on a good day if, if the reservoir is full and the pumps are working. So we have the most expensive, inadequate, um, unreliable water system that you can imagine. As compared to that to what we had before. So, one of the questions that people are asking, and I want to relate to you, is that is there any federal funding available for an economic development plan to, for green energy programs to develop Murray Creek and get it back online? I know it's a provincial uh, water jurisdiction, but I'm just curious if there's anything that the federal government has for green energy. Get into this, 
and it's really short, so I won't take up too much time. In the Thompson Lake Regional District, we waded through the troubling waters of spring flooding, unlike any we have ever seen, and right into the hot coals of a relentless, terrifying wildfire. The seemingly never-ending Elgin Hill wildfire, it is still burning, by the way, is an unprecedented event that destroyed homes, evacuated residents in droves, shut or burned down businesses, took out our local airport, the list goes on. How many homes will be replaced? How many businesses will reopen? The jury is out, and only time will tell, but it is a huge social and economic hit for our area. That said, we learned a couple of valuable lessons. Wildfires have become a part of every summer in the interior. Conditions range from good to excellent, with the dry climate, forest full of fuel, pine beetle and otherwise, the perfect firestorm. Yet we have no comprehensive plan in place to address disaster mitigation in the future. As resources were at a premium from a manpower and equipment perspective for this wildfire because of the huge scope and number of fires, that is one issue. However, we need to focus on wildfire mitigation where the fire danger is greatest. The interior certainly falls into that category. Logan Lake has done an incredible job of wildfire mitigation in their community, and it should be noted that they have had many fires knocking on their door, yet most re recently none have been let in. Taking a closer look at that model and others might be a first step. However, securing funding for any model has been very challenging, whether a municipality or a regional district, and this is where the federal government can come in. What the damage that will continue to be inflicted by these disasters in coming years, with the damage that uh, will be continue to be inflicted in the coming years, it seems it would be in the best interest of everyone to earmark some serious funding towards disaster mitigation. This is where the federal government can play a significant role in the impact of these disasters in small rural communities across Canada. So that's one thing. And then real quick, I'll touch on this, and that's the gas tax, the federal gas tax funding. My federal gas tax funding, we've asked for the last, I think, five years at UBCM to expand it to fire departments, volunteer fire departments. We've been turned back at every turn. We've had a resolution go to UBCM. Our regional district has supported this. Still, we have no gas tax funding available for fire protection. With the current download of the playbook on our volunteer fire departments across the province, by the way, and the download of cost to local government, i.e. the TNRD, um, we and the local fire departments like Spencer's Bridge, we do not have the resources as a small rural fire department, as does not Loon Lake, and the list goes on, to actually meet the mandate of the playbook. The mandate is black and white. There is no gray area. They presented our board last week. I asked that question specifically to Dave Mitchell and Associates who did the fires review within the TNRD. There is no gray area, it's black and white. If you do not meet the mandate, you do not have a volunteer fire department. So this is serious business. We need the gas tax, federal gas tax, to be expanded, especially with the download on BC. I don't know if other provinces are doing the same kind of thing, but we are in a perilous situation with our regional districts, with our municipalities, and in this case, improvement districts, to be able to have fire protection and safety for our citizens without federal gas tax. I have a boatload of gas tax money that I literally cannot spend because I do not have the infrastructure. I go out looking and asking people, I need, we need to spend my gas tax money. I, because the scope is so narrow within federal gas tax, it is impossible in my electoral area to spend that gas tax money. I could. You know, we could buy a fire truck tomorrow, let's put it that way, if the federal gas tax is expanded to include volunteer fire departments. Thanks, David. Yeah. Thank you. I think that the uh, message through you to um, Minister Mark Darnell, Minister of Transport, about the railway tie issue, that's one thing that we can do right now. But it takes somebody to tell the CPR which ends up because the CPR doesn't care. So the minister can direct the CPR to do such things. I can answer the question. Great. Yeah. 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 I'd like to get into that situation, has the money, you don't know where to spend it. Yeah. I know, it's a good place to be. It's, it's a good problem. It could be better. Yeah. It could be better. Uh, I was making notes that we go uh, along railway lines. I'm very uh, confident that I can talk to Mr. Bourneau. Uh, he was the only minister available during my campaign that came to my town and the fundraising, so I worked very closely with Mr. Bourneau. Uh, I'll definitely push the button on that. And 
that doesn't give us any lead and makes us upset that Don Gordon you sure uh, put it down to the pages on the most of taking uh everybody there. Uh NAFTA uh, is a very tricky issue. Uh, as you know, the mindset uh, across the line is very different. Uh, we have a very strong team when it comes down to negotiation. General Leslie, Richard Freeland, the Minister of Villa. I mean, we have the best of the best. Uh, as we all know, uh, American system is really different. The uh, minister uh, uh, is on one side, the commerce is on the other side. So it's a commerce department. Uh, they are keen, uh, as Mr. John Paul was saying, America first. Uh, to my government's approach, maybe it's given us the opportunity to go somewhere else, to look somewhere else in the world. I serve in the foreign affairs, I travel quite a bit. I am often going to China, Indonesia, Vietnam. We are a trading nation, we have to sell our product. If we can't do it in America, then we'll do it somewhere else. Uh, uh, software number is very close to my heart because 50% of the software number is being produced in British Columbia. Uh, I've been traveling with the with the BC government actually for about 10, 15 years. We have opened up uh, a market in China. 40% of our number goes to China now. Uh, the only problem uh, the local producers have a little more money to ship them out there. If there's any problem, it's hard uh, to address that issue. Uh, but if we don't have any other alternative. Uh, we're looking at it in a different part of, uh, different part of the world. Uh, tourism, we're pushing very hard actually uh, around the world. We have the best country in the world. Uh, we're encouraging people to come uh, in our country, in this region, uh, anywhere in Canada uh, to bring in some money. There are some countries around the world that live off of tourism, countries like Singapore and others. Uh, Tracy uh, made a very good uh, comment. Climate change, uh, we all know, uh, is here to stay. And maybe this is one of the reasons that actually we uh, feel that the other fish is kind of changing its pattern. Uh, but I definitely talked to uh, Terry Beach. Uh, he's a, a part of the secretary for Dominic. I mean, Dominic is no new with this business as well. His father was the Ocean and Fisheries Minister, if you recall it. Mm -hmm. uh, Terry Beach, uh, he, he worked with, uh, uh, with Dominic. Uh, I'll talk to that issue. It's, uh, uh, I hear you loud and clear. How did you address it? Uh, uh, work with me, please. Uh, I need more information. I need to talk to Terry, sit down with him, and see how we can improve it. Uh, water issue, uh, then again, I need to help. My Prime Minister approach is, you tell me what you need. You find a box to, to mark it, and I'll help you. The last two years, I don't think there's any file uh, coming to my, my office that hasn't been approved. So you have to find an appropriate box, how uh, we can pay that debt. Uh, replacing pumps and all that coming down to your idea, it's not an issue at all. Uh, we're very keen at the uh, Harrison Hot Spring, we made an announcement last week uh, on running water and replacing water pumps and all that. But you have to apply. And give it to me, the file, I'll make sure that it's, it's, it's looked after. Uh, that I can promise you on that. Uh, I live at the farm in Abbotsford. Uh, it's five minutes away from the city hall in Abbotsford. And I on uh, spring water. If I need to get city water, it's going to cost me $80,000. And on my street, people are not willing to pay $80,000. So I feed five homes on 
uh, on my uh, street. I have tons of water. We have filter system, uh, so I don't have to pay uh, any penny uh, for the water. Uh, this is the issue. Uh, we have a huge country uh, to service every home. It is a bit of a challenge, but like I said, uh, I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to work with you uh, on, on the water issue. Uh, uh, fire actually started from our riding at Boston Flats, uh, uh, close to Ashcroft. The uh, Prime Minister was generous enough to take me uh, in his chopper uh, to look at the area. Uh, my goodness, Mother Nature, it's, it's very hard. Uh, I made a proposal in Medium Lakes that we should create a perimeter around uh, every town, maybe 100 meters wide, so the fire can come closer. They, they said, Mr. Shadu, uh, you don't know fire. Mm -hmm. I mean, they could cross within 10 seconds from the top of the, the, of the river on the other side to this side within 10 seconds. Uh, thank God we haven't lost any life. Uh, I have a lot of respect for the men and women who fought the fire uh, day in and day night. Uh, we did help, by the way, somebody uh, put the question on. 27 to 30 million dollars. Uh, it comes under BC's jurisdiction. Uh, if they ask for help, federal government is always there. Uh, but that's all they ask. Uh, Mr. Holden was with us uh, during that trip. And defense minister was there, Carla Holdro, uh, uh, we're about six, seven uh, uh, responsible people for that. But after that, there was no more ask from the, from the province to help. Uh, but if they ask more money, we're all with their uh, We're trying uh, to help me in a different way. I, mean, I was very pleased uh, within a couple of months, uh, end of October uh, <coughs> 2015, uh, we were able to reduce 7% uh, tax uh, to families making less than $90,000, $50,000, I forgot the pick of them, that was the first thing. And we tax the rich, uh, and this is the mandate that was given to, uh, given to us during the campaign. There were doors shut on my face saying that you're going to tax us, we're making more than $200,000, we're not going to vote for you. I said, well, that's fine, but this is what we're going to do. And we'll continue on to do it. Uh, last month, we uh, tax the corporations and by 2019 we are going to be the lowest tax paying nation out of G7 countries and I'm very glad to work with my government to set 10.5% now, it's going to be 10 next year, it's going to be 9% in 2019. GIS, the very first year, uh, we increased by 10% ranking in from something uh, to my figures, there were 300,000 seniors in the country, they, uh, they came out of the poverty line. Child benefit. This country has never seen a system where you don't have to claim a child benefit. Uh, I know in this town, I don't see many children. <laughs> but there are children, children, two children, single mother, single father, it gets $670 tax free every month. This is a lot of money and a lot of help. Those are the areas that you know, we're trying to help. I mean, the other thing we did in the very first year brought the, uh, the uh, retirement age. The last government, the last 10 years, they wanted to increase it from 65 to 67. We brought it back to 65 years. So that helped a lot of seniors in our country uh, to make their hands meet. So different way we're trying to reach every Canadian who needs help. This is my Prime Minister's statement. We're there to do a common good to common Canadians, not the rich corporations. But work with me, I'd love to help. And I'm very uh, confident that somewhere there along the line we should be able to resolve the, uh, the water issue. Thank you for being here. Thank you.
Thank you. Anybody else have anything to say? Questions? Oh, Ray, come on up. Come on. Um, no, um, just touching on that 1.2 million that we have all been mailed to pay that. That was two loans. One was for 400,000, the second one was for 800, or vice versa. And that was in the early stages of construction. At that point, the TNRD and Cook Ferry would partner to take over management of this new upgraded water system. Um, they hadn't received forthcoming grants and contributions yet at that point. I've done the research myself, hours and hours and days and weeks and months of it, and from information available on federal and provincial financial statement websites as well as INAC, uh, the TNRD and Cooks Ferry jointly received a minimum of $5 million in grants and contributions. So I'm still wondering, because no one wants to talk about it, that you ask at those levels, is the reason that we have been forced to pay this back at $10,000 per parcel. I'm on disability, that's my entire annual income. And because we, it's, it's very cool, as far as I can make any sense of this, we signed an agreement with them to pay back these loans. So whether or not they got money to cover all of that, we signed a contract. And I feel like this is why they're pursuing it and haven't just waived it entirely. They received grants and contributions in excess of the total project cost. Okay, so if you can look into that, we'd appreciate it. And secondly, the thing that everyone's already told you about is this inadequate, shiny, expensive new system which they didn't even replace all the lines on. And there's been problems with cracks in the lines and et cetera since all of it. And, but the day the fire started was my watering day. We're on odd even days. And so I've been out watering in the morning, and tinder sink and dry here for two or three weeks up till that point. So 11 o'clock, I turn off all my sprinklers and everything, and I go inside to have my lunch, take my Scrabble turns on Facebook, and there was messages already all over the place on Facebook about this fire starting in Ashcroft. And of course I have a lot of friends up there, and including at Boston Flats, and so I was, oh my god, and it was so windy that day, and it's our saving grace here was the direction the wind was blowing. So if it had been blowing this way, it could have been us. So anyway, of course the water thing is a concern. We all know the math was done at the onset of this project that this new system doesn't have the capacity to manage a fire any magnitude. We're screwed if it comes here. And I can't wait till 6 o'clock to go start watering everything down. Lo and behold, at 4 o'clock that afternoon, the TNRD left a message on my answering machine to cease irrigating. Cease. Yeah. <coughs> Sir, cease. All irrigating. So now someone who suffers PTSD as it is, I have trouble getting outside of my own door some days, which is half the reason I have my business where I do on my property, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I spent the next 48 hours, what do I, what do I keep on my back door to pack up if the fire does come here? I have enough gas to get back to town and that's it, but that station was closed because of the fire. And uh, just the panic grew and grew and grew. I spent the following four days inside my trailer with my curtains closed. If the fire comes here, I don't even want to know because there's not a damn thing I can do about it. I'm just going to go down with my ship. It took me 10 years to get it to where it is now. Oh, yeah, so maybe it's my tools I should have ready by the back door to pack up because if I lose everything, I'm going to be starting all over again and I can't afford to replace it. Four days and it goes by and I'm in this depression. Ready to just do everything. And I wander out to go over to the store to go talk with you know locals and find out not everybody got that phone call even. And I don't want to name names, but certain you know people in this room, their family members were watering, happily watering that same evening. Like what is going on with that? What is going on? Our own TNRD director's brother was one. Yeah, this is something's just so not right with all of this. Anyway, yeah, the system is inadequate, and we're paying for something that I don't believe we should be. Like I said, I did the research myself. 
the numbers of the information is all available publicly. Some's been removed from the TNRD site since word wind got out that I was researching all this two years ago, but it's there. So we were being charged for something that's been paid for. Bridge Improvement District got to find for watering the field of the irrigation, the, the underground irrigation system went on by accident because they're trying to rebuild the timers in the, in the system. And the TNRD water Nazi came by and gave the Improvement District a ticket. And so they don't discriminate, you know. And Roy over here got how many, Roy? How many do you do? Three? Because he waters after their 11 o'clock because he has an RV party. There's a grass that can have to wash. The next one. It's cheaper to pay out the packet and all that, unfortunately. You don't crack the bed, you have to wash it down. You just want to pay for it. It's free. It's free. It's free. Thursday night. Now, I had a gentleman that stood beside the fire chief and he said to him, get your guys out to get it put down. And he said, no, I can't find a reserve unless it's a structured fire. Now, if that's true, then that's what happened. Perhaps. So Friday morning when we got up, so we got this massive situation. Now, if that's true on a federal land, then that could be looked at because that should be put out all that time and it's down as a forestry fire by it because it's done two years in the past. We could have been caught now and there could, like in, in other countries, they do a backup system where we would go down the natural and they would put it 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 down and that's the way it should be. But a federal land, that would be, if there's a fire, it should be put out. Thank you. Thanks for that. Wayne, did you want to talk about Wayne Ross? There's an inequity here that personally I am offended by. And that's the fact that half of this community is a native community. It seems the law is going to apply to them. They were given all the money they needed for their portion of the water system, which they now own. 55% of our water system. We only own 45%. They have control and shares in what happens to it. It was totally paid for by the Canadian taxpayer. Us. We paid for that. And we have to pay for our own as well. I'm sorry, I'm a little pissed off. But I get told I can't water, and I drive by Cumpsheen. And they've got sprinklers going in the middle of the lawn all day long. They're, they're beyond reproach. So I'm into equality. And I don't care what issues natives have with things our forefathers did. Right now, right today, equality. Now, before I get further to that, I've lived in this community for off and on for three years now. In those three years, I have witnessed personally three train started fires. One I put out, the tracks were on fire. Who else starts the tracks on fire? The other one was across from Bighorn last year. That, unless bears now are smoking and playing with matches, that was a train started fire. Shaw Springs this year was a train started fire. Canadian taxpayer paid for that. If I was caught with a cigarette, throwing it out, and having a fire start from that, I could be charged and fined. CN and CP are having punity. Let's start back charging them for all the firefighting costs. I will stake my life on it that the Elephant Hill fire started from a train. It was. But 
they don't have the balls, the forensic yeah. fire people do not have the balls to blame CN. So they just say humans started. That has taken out communities. It is still on fire. There's underground fires burning up north. And what is the railroad doing? Oh, they had a coal spill this fall, or no, this spring. And people who used the river water to drink out of were told they couldn't drink the water. I contacted the railroad saying, what are the options? Are you going to provide these people with drinking water? No, no, that's their problem, basically. Uh, so I know a family that had to buy water. Then I actually helped them steal water from Spencer's Bridge because <laughs> Coach Ferry then denied them access to the river to pump water out of there so that they could at least have tanks and get water. I'm sorry, this whole system is fucked up. And if you want to do something, get off your ass and do it. Don't just sit around with glad hand and you know, go home. Why you didn't come here? Well, I didn't come to I don't know. We don't I didn't come to ask for your home. I'm here to help you now. They might have got that right. He's getting our message right. Yeah. Yes. 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 Well, I hear it. I hear it. Well, but well, then so many politicians were abused with politicians saying they want to help. And then when they get elected, and then they get to, and the process happens, and oh, well, we found a question fiscally viable. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm no way. Michael, I'm not a goal, but can I comment directly on what you said about the fires? Okay. 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 okay, so just so we know, what to UBCM a year and a half ago, okay, and lobby for the train, good point, they start a lot of fires, absolutely correct. CN stepped the table, came to our board table. For the first time in their history, they have blocked off most of July and August because of my efforts to get the wildfire from both railroads to stop. For the first time ever this year, they did not do any track grinding in the months of July and October. For the entire province, I'm pretty proud of that. Now, CP has not come to the table yet to do the same thing. So I can ask for your help to have CP come to the board, the DNRD board, and make the same commitment to the CN has made. Their calendar is blocked out for July and August. A small step granted, but to your point, at least it's a start. Thank you. 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 Thank you.